the cytology. We have uh, already seen cell membrane, protoplasm with its organelles, inclusion and uh, briefly cytoplasm. And the last topic remained to be covered today would therefore be the karyoplasm or the nucleus. The nucleus follows the shape of the cell. If the cell is oval, the nucleus would also be oval. If it is elongated, same nucleus would be elongated or flattened when the cell is flattened. It is usually found toward the center, not exactly in the center, but around the center in many of the cases. But sometimes you may also find it pushed basally or peripherally, as the case may be, but usually it is found toward the center. The cell, the, sorry, the nucleus, is where the genetic material of the cells are found residing on the DNA and uh, in our nucleus we have a estimated number of about 20 to 25,000 genes made by a series of base pairs of the DNA transcribing for more than 100,000 proteins. So because the nucleus contains such DNA material for formation of proteins, the nucleus is very much important because we have seen and you know that proteins are important because all enzymes regulating the activities of the cells are proteins. Proteins are also structural. Proteins are receptors. And there are many things that proteins do. So because of this, the nucleus is very much important part of the cell. And uh, this is found within the cell in very well prepared specimen. You can see the nucleus very clearly. Like for example, in this picture here, you can see the nucleus with its content found within the cells. Many cells have one nucleus, but there are also conditions where cells may have two or more nuclei. But in general, we treat it as one nucleus found within the cell. When we look at it is makeup, the nucleus is membranous structure. People can also refer it as a, an organelle. Uh, it has a membrane. The membranes are double, double membrane, make the nuclear envelope. And within it, the DNA would be found associated with proteins making chromatins. So the next component we are going to look at would therefore be chromatins. Then we have one or multiple regions within the nucleus appear densely marked like this one. When they are present, they are not more than 10. Even they don't reach that much 10, I will tell you soon why number cannot exceed 10, are found within the nucleus as nucleolus, nucleolus singular, nucleoli plural. So a nucleus may have one nucleolus, or more nucleoli. The ground is made by a ground substance like structure or substance named nucleoplasm. So that's what we are going to look at one after another. If we begin with the nuclear envelope, I told you the nuclear envelope is made by double membrane, same as the mitochondria. I've shown you yesterday, the mitochondria has an outer and inner membranes 
Here also we have an outer and inner membranes wrapping the nucleus. These are diagrams, but this is a, a photograph taken under electron microscopy. Here also you can see two layers, double. These two layers are running parallel to each other. This is unlike we saw yesterday for the mitochondria because the inner membrane of the mitochondria, we have seen it folded inward to increase surface area, creating the crystal. But here, both membranes run together, but the outer one has attached polyribosomes on it, and the inner one is from inside supported by a network of mainly laminate intermediate filaments forming what are named as uh, the nuclear lamina. Excuse me, let me silence this one. Okay, so here we have a network of uh, the structures found below the inner nuclear membranes. These are named as fibrous lamina. They are important, one, for structural support. Two, they are also important for adhesion of chromatins. I will show you later. Some of the chromatins are fixed to this fibrous nuclear lamina, which is basically made by intermediate filaments known as lamines, but other structures, proteins are also added. The outer nuclear membrane is, as we have said yesterday, at intervals becomes continuous with that of rough endoplasmic reticulum, as is indicated here and here. You can see it. And uh, it's also, I told you, has attached polyribosomes. So the outer nuclear membrane is just nothing, but it is a uh, as if the raphidoplasmic reticulum has come and extended to make such wrappings. These two membranes, the outer and the inner membranes, are coming to fuse with each other at intervals, creating pores. So the made by netting but at sites where the outer and the inner nuclear membranes have come and fused so that a tiny pore is formed. These are in thousands in number. And uh, these pores have initially diameters of about 100 nanometer, but uh, this would be fitted by nuclear core complex, mainly made by glycoproteins, nucleoporins, so that when these nucleoporins are fitted into such gap regions, the pore size, the diameter, would diminish. It would diminish into only about 11 nanometer, allowing communication of the nuclear content with the cytoplasm. These pores are same as you have windows are made into the buildings. You know, before the glasses and uh, those structures at the window are fitted, the window is left initially during construction as a gap. So that gap has a wider diameter than later when the windows, the glasses, and the metal frames are fitted into the window gap. So it is same as this, that initially the pores have a wider diameter of about 100 nanometer, but later when the nuclear pore complex, nuclear porins, are fitted into it. These nucleoporins are made by two octagonal rings, ring-like structures of glycoproteins, an outer ring and an inner ring. These have each 
eight subunits. That's why they are named as an outer and inner octagonal rings. These are supported, connected by extensions of filaments. From the outer, we have filaments running into the cytoplasm. From the inner, we have another filaments running towards the interior of the nucleus, further reducing the diameter into a basket-like structure. So here we have a basket-like structures. Structure is made by the extension of such filaments running from the inner ring towards the interior of the nucleus. So in this type of a manner, we have several thousands of such communicating sites between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. Because we need to have the RNAs getting out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. Proteins are coming from cytoplasm into the nucleus, and the further communications are needed. So for this purposes, we have the pores serving their function. So that's what I can tell you about uh, with regard to the nuclear envelope or nuclear membrane made by double membranes. Then the important content of the nucleus is uh, or are the chromatins. Chromatins are nothing but they are DNA combined with proteins. Important proteins are uh, found connected to the DNA materials, associated with the DNA materials. Look at this. This is what the DNA double helix looks like, made by several base pairs of nucleotides. And this DNA should be associated with important proteins. One important protein we have for this purpose are a group of proteins known as histone. But we also have non-histone proteins. These are important for packing the DNA into condensed forms of uh, chromatins. Because these chromatins, this DNA molecule is very big. It is an elongated and it is a delicate structure. If it remains extended, it would easily get damaged and be broken down. But this should not take place because of its specific packaging by folding, by wrapping itself around special proteins of histone and non-histone proteins. This type of even coiling and the packing would be more exaggerated making the chromatins highly condensed, creating what are known as chromosomes. You know what chromosomes are? We have uh, in our cells 46 chromosomes, 23 paired chromosomes in a cell, in the nucleus of the cell. If these are left extended, <coughs> they could easily get entangled with each other. We don't need all part of the DNA is exposed because for formation of protein, transcription should only take place only for those required proteins. Over this DNA, we have several genes. We don't need all the genes exposed. We need only the genes that are required for formation of proteins B extended like this one, whereas those which are not needed should be folded, coiled, and systematically packed. When needed, they should later be unpacked. And especially during cell division, when chromosomes are needed to be separated to the different cells, they have to be highly packed, super coiled into chromosomes. So that's how our chromatins are found. During the interface, they are not packed highly into chromosomes. Instead, they are wrapped and coiled into what are known as chromatins. 
when there is cell division, the chromatins would be highly supercoiled to give us chromosomes. So that's how the DNA associated with proteins are found in our cells. For purpose of coiling, we have uh, initially the chromatins are coiled around a core proteins and this type of initial coiling would give us what are named as a, um, nucleosomes. Look at this. Here we have one nucleosome. Here we have another nucleosome. For formation of one nucleosome, we have about 146 to 166 base pairs of the DNA is wrapped twice in a core protein. This core protein is made by a pair of four types of histone proteins, like this one. So this are like this one, this brownish outline are made by a pair of four, one, two, three, four. From below, you have one, four. A pair of four histone proteins around which 146 to 166 base pairs of the DNA material is wrapped twice, making nucleosomes, which is only about 10 to 11 nanometer in its diameter. These are interconnected one with another by link protein, by link DNA strands. This link DNA strands are only about 48 base pairs. So in this type of manner, initially the DNA is coiled. Again, this is further folded and further coiled to give us a super coiled type of chromatin, which would able to reduce the size of the DNA material by about 10,000 folds. So this has now reduced the size of the DNA when a chromosome is made, reduced by about 10,000 folds. When needed, regions of needed DNA material where the needed genes are located would be unwrapped easily and then transcription takes place and then again could be packed and repacked. So that's how the chromatids are formed. So this means that there are regions of chromatids which are actively transcribing RNA molecules, and also there are other regions of the chromatids which are not engaged in transcription. Those which are actively engaged should be uncoiled when they are uncoiled, their size becomes small. When they are inactive, they are packed together, so they appear bigger and they become visible. And because of this, we can divide our chromatins, those which are inactive and visible, and those which are active, unwrapped, becomes thinner and as such invisible under light microscopy. These are termed as euchromatins, and heterochromatins. Look at this is what a nucleus under electron microscopy looks like. Here inside you have a dense dense granulated type of regions as well as a lighter in between regions. The lighter in between regions are mainly made by euchromatin. These are lightly stained because they are active regions because they are unwrapped and the DNA is tiny and it is not as visible as regions which are inactive and packed and give us heterochromatins. Heterochromatins are this densely granulated or basophilic under light microscopy, they appear as basophilic. Under electron microscopy, they appear granulated type of regions and these are inactive regions. These are appeared as such because they are packed and they are accumulated. So you 
are able to see them. So our chromatins in the nucleus could be divided into euchromatins and heterochromatins. Euchromatins are the active ones engaged in transcription, so they are unwrapped, they are uncoiled, they are thinner, and they are not as visible as when they are packed and non active. So that's how your chromatins are visible. And when we look at this heterochromatin a little bit more further, look at this, they are located at different locations. Some are dispersed, smaller in size, some are found nearer the nuclear envelope. Some others are found at one region around the nucleolus, so we can divide them into the following types, regionally. One group <coughs> are found marginally, around the inner nuclear membrane, around the nuclear lamina. I told you the nuclear lamina serves as attachment for the chromatids. So some are attached to it and uh, they are found marginally. We call them marginal chromatin. Others are dispersed like this one throughout the nucleus. The nucleus we call this cariosomal chromatin. Another group are found around the nucleolus. I will show you soon why they are found there. And these are named as nucleolar associated chromatins around the nucleolus. And then one important inactive chromatins represent the X chromosomes in the female. You know, in females, there are two X chromosomes, while in the male, there is only one X chromosome. The other one is Y chromosome. In the female, there is no Y chromosome. In the uh, uh, male, uh, in addition to the Y chromosome, there is only one X chromosome. That means that for survival, one X chromosome is enough. But for sex determination and few additional female characteristics, maybe an additional X chromosome is needed. Of course, it is needed for sex determination in early development. But later, one of the X chromosome but randomly becomes inactive, meaning out of the two. One X chromosome in the female has come from the maternal, we call it maternal X chromosome. Another X chromosome is coming from sperm cell, we call it paternal X chromosome. And which one gets inactivated randomly? You see, in female twins, you may have such in non-uniform type of inactivation. Though they have those same type of Maternal X chromosome, paternal X chromosome are similar. In one of the female twins, monozygotic twins, you see why they may be different for a few uh, characteristics. Maybe even this one is the reason. I'm speaking about inactivation of X chromosome in the female, which takes place randomly. In some, it is a paternal, which is inactivated and it becomes heterochromatin, whereas the other one, would become active. Of course, it also has part of its inactive as heterochromatin, but the whole of one of the X chromosome becomes inactive and heterochromatin randomly. And this inactive chromosome usually is found marginal. It is found marginal, clamped together. And in many of epithelial cells, it appears as a bigger, bar type of structure and it is named as bar body like this one here it is only to be expected in the female it is not found in the male <clears throat> in one type of white blood cells known as neutrophils this appears as an appendage this appendage look like a drumstick so we call it a drumstick appendage only present in uh, neutral fields of uh, females. In the males, this is not present. So this is also nothing but uh, inactive chromatins, whole X chromatins this time, and uh, we call it bar bodies or drumstick of the neutral fields. 
or different shaped uh, appendage. Then uh, we have uh, the nucleolus. I have shown you the nuclear envelope. I've shown you about the chromatins. And now let me speak about the nucleolus, which may be one or multiple. But when it is multiple, which does not even reach to that much number, it cannot exceed 10. Instead, it may be two, three, maximum about four or five, no more than that. And for reasons. And uh, it is located within the nucleus, eccentrically, like this or not, exactly in the center of the center. And it is the site of uh, ribosomal RNA synthesis and assembly of ribosomes. I told you, I mentioned this yesterday when we spoke about the ribosomes, where they are assembled, where they are synthesized. We say ribosomes are made by ribosomal RNA and proteins. This ribosomal RNA should be transcribed within the nucleus in this region from a given genes of DNA residing on chromosomes. The proteins should come from uh, the cytoplasm and uh, are get assembled with this ribosomal RNA in a region, and that region I'm saying is uh, this one, and it is termed nucleolus. The ribosomal RNA are transcripts of DNA. The DNA which are supposed or which are transcribing ribosomal RNA are found only on genes residing on five chromosomes. These five chromosomes are in pairs because we have 23 paired chromosomes. Out of these 23 chromosomes, only five of them, which are found in pairs, are responsible for transcription of ribosomal RNA. So in this region, we have regions of genes of five paired chromosomes, which usually come at a given region. When they all are found in one region, we have one nucleolus. But in some cases, they may split in two regions. In that cases, you can have two nucleolus. In some other cases, when a large amount of ribosomes are needed, when the DNA, the genes residing on those DNA are actively transcribing, they may even further split into three or four or maximum about five places. When that is the case, we therefore have that much number of nucleolus. But they don't even get separated into 10 sites. The maximum, the maximum they can split is only to split into 10 because they are located only on 10 chromosomes, meaning five paired chromosomes. That's the reason I've been telling you that if one is thinking the possible maximum number of nucleolus one can have is no more than 10. That does not even happen. And if it is to happen, it is when all the 10 chromosomes get separated. And these chromosomes are known. And I want to uh, tell you that these are found around a region within the nucleolus known as pars amorpha. But we also have uh, within the nucleolus the recently transcribed RNA named as pars fibrosa and the assembled ribosomes as pars granulosa. So those DNA, regions of DNA <coughs> for transcription of ribosomal RNA are found in a given given regions and these regions are named pars amorpha, like this one, nuclear organizer DNA, which are found on only chromosome number 13, number 14, 15, 21, and 22. Look at what they are doing diagrammatically. This diagram is the best one to understand. Look at this one, count this one, two, three, four, five. These are all 
Here counts this. This are ten. This could be chromosome number thirteen, paternal. This could be chromosome number thirteen, maternal. This could be chromosome number twenty-one, paternal. This could be chromosome number twenty-one, maternal. Look at what they are doing. This elongated chromosome or chromatin has only donated its region where ribosomal RNA is. To be transcribed. The other region of that same DNA is not brought here. So, what are brought to this region, which is going to appear?